Welcome to Rocket Island, an exotic American outpost in the middle of the Pacific. It's the most precious pearl in a strand of 100 islands that form the world's largest lagoon. Fabulous. There's nothing better than living on a tropical island. I pretty much have beachfront property, you know? It's great, I love it here. Beyond the alfresco dining, the nightlife can be spectacular in more ways than one. For this is Kwajalein, a highly sensitive military base with a deadly purpose. Four times a year, it's the target of Washington's ultimate deterrent. Nearly 8,000 kilometres away in Vandenberg, California, a disarmed Minuteman ballistic missile blasts off. In order for a weapon to be a weapon of deterrence, it needs to be proven that, in fact, it will work. We want to know that it's as accurate as possible so that when a decision is made by the President of the United States, he can be assured that exactly what he has asked for, he can have. The missile reaches speeds of 38,000 kilometres an hour before arcing towards a splashdown at Kwajalein Atoll. It's a surreal light show. Each of the three re-entry vehicles is designed to carry a nuclear warhead 25 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. This is about testing the delivery vehicle for an enormous nuclear weapon. That is correct. So uh, it, you saw something where anywhere else in the world, if somebody saw it, it'd be the last thing they saw. That America chooses such a splendid location to rehearse for Armageddon may appear ironic. But there is a cold, hard logic to it all. When it came time to start doing some missile testing in the 50s, we had to look for an area that had wide open spaces, not a lot of people, so that we could do things very safely. And so Kwajalein became a perfect area to do that type of operation. But all work and no play makes for a dull rocket scientist. 1,500 US workers and their families are here, and they're determined to keep living the American dream. It's like small town America growing up in the 60s and early 70s. It's that type of environment where you don't need to lock your doors at night. Everybody knows everybody, and uh, it, it's just, a, it's a great community. We haven't had issues with, with protesters. In Range Commander Lieutenant Colonel Harold Buell gives us a big picture briefing of his world. So the silo's here. Kwajalein is also a sophisticated surveillance base. America's eyes and ears, covering a third of the planet and beyond. When we're not doing these complex missile testings, we fill up the rest of our times looking at space, conducting surveillance, understanding where satellites are, where they're moving, and what their general orientations are. Our sensors can stretch from an area roughly from India to Canada, and of course from the surface of the ocean uh, all the way to uh, the moon and beyond if necessary. Washington is determined that Pax Americana, the American peace, will continue to reign over the Pacific. Kwajalein's proximity to the equator means it's perfectly placed to detect trouble. 
how quickly would you be able to detect a rogue launch in this region? In this uh, most launches depend on uh, their, their flight time, and most flight times are within about uh, 15 to 20 minutes yeah. of Kwajalein. If hypothetically the North Koreans launched a missile south into the South Pacific, you would detect that here quite swiftly. Rest assured, anything that, that uh, uh, breaches the horizon from our sensors perspective, we'll be able to pick it up and see it. Beyond the radar is a small army of Marshall Islanders, quietly keeping the base running and the grounds manicured, earning $5 an hour for their efforts. More than 900 work here, making the US Army one of the biggest employers in the Marshall Islands, and an economic pillar of this poor Pacific nation. At the end of their working day, the Marshallese pile aboard for the 20 minute commute home across the lagoon. It's a journey from the first world to the third. Their destination is no country club, but a small island dubbed the Slum of the Pacific. This is Ebai, home to 15,000 people, a quarter of the country's entire population and they're crammed into just 32 hectares, an area smaller than the average golf course. We have running water three days a week, sometimes two days a week. And the power, um, right now, we don't know if, if uh, the boat's not bringing the fuel. If it doesn't arrive tomorrow, we're going to shut down the sewer line come up on the street and all kinds of stuff. 2,000 kids, they don't go to school at all. Not enough room, not enough teacher. It's a very difficult life here on Ebay. Mike Kabua is both a senator in the national parliament and a traditional chief and landowner of this island. At times he appears overwhelmed as he wades through fragments of the past attempting to piece together exactly who owns what in his realm. A century ago, just 100 people lived here. But as the Americans expanded the missile range in the late 1950s, they leased several islands in the atoll, forcing the inhabitants to relocate to Ebai. Marshallese from other parts of the country were also lured here in search of work at the base. By the 1980s, there were 8,000 people on the island. Now, it's 15,000, half of them children. Many in Roseanne Jackson's neighborhood live in squalor. More than 40 people living here. 40 people in this area here. So how can you fit 40 people in there? Where do they sleep? They'll sleep like sardine, maybe. <laughs> they, uh, yeah, like, like that. Like, like that. <laughs> Roseanne is more fortunate, and she takes us to her home. After years working at the base, she can afford to live here in relative comfort with her many children and grandchildren. What's life like here? Hard. Not too good. Expensive. Too crowded. Do you get angry about it? Sometimes, sometimes we complain. Mm. But what can we do? But after 45 years on Ebay, she wants to return to live on her home island, Where was your island again? which lies in the middle of the missile range. My island is here, right here. Actually, these two, because I was born here. This mm -hmm. is from my mom's side, and this is from my dad's side. This is like a paradise. It's my home. Home sweet home, and it's hard to get away for too long. It's little wonder that they dream of escaping this. With so many people packed onto Ebay, there's no room for playing fields. So a corner of the dump doubles as a ballpark. As the field straddles the entire width of the island, Hitting home runs can be problematic. 
Have you lost any balls in the rubbish or in the ocean? We used to be, yeah. But we haven't kept them now. They're still out there. This is a mess the US is not willing to clean up. We have softball fields and uh, we have soccer fields and we have a lot of activities for people to do in their off time. We got scuba diving and... Across the lagoon, base commander Colonel Frederick Clark sees himself as the mayor of Kwajalein. And while he wants to help, he's adamant that he can't take responsibility for Ebi. Don't you feel you have a moral obligation to do more over there? I don't think Ebi was created for um, for United States Army Kwajalein Atoll. It existed before. Um, so our, you know, our obligation is, is towards the workforce uh, that, that live here. Like I said before, we have a symbiotic relationship. And uh, when they have an issue, uh, we're there with them. For instance, when I first took command, on the second day of my command, they were having generator problems. And we deployed six generators to their area to make sure that the Yowen power was maintained and that their sewage pumps would continue to work. So when they've asked for help, we try to come up with the best solution because what happens to them affects us as well. Yeah, but uh, you've got 15,000 people over there on a small island. I've been on bigger golf courses. I think we're doing everything that we can. We don't see it as our issue per se. Giff Johnson, editor of the Marshall Islands only newspaper and a one-time resident of Ebi says Washington can't sidestep responsibility. The problem is, is that Ebi is a creation of the United States. They, you know, shunted people off islands and stuck them on Ebi. And yeah, they created the situation. I mean, there's no question. It's, it's absolutely a fact that the U.S. set it up. The Marshall Islands is a collection of coral atolls strung out across the vast Pacific and totally dependent on US aid. From Kwajalein, it's more than 500 kilometers to the capital, Majuro. We arrive as American officials are celebrating their 4th of July Independence Day. It's a sad, half-hearted affair. Everyone has Kwajalein on their mind. Mr. President. But the US diplomats and the Marshall Islands president, the Tokwe Tomei, all refused to talk to us. The Marshallese were ruled by Washington until being granted their own independence in 1986. The Americans say they can't take charge on Ebi now because of the delicate issue of sovereignty. But like so many Pacific microstates, the Marshall's administration borders on the dysfunctional, paralyzed by self-interest and clan rivalries. The Marshall Islands could do more, and frankly, successive governments of the Marshall Islands haven't done much. And Ebi has just sort of been out there on the fringe somewhere, and when there's a crisis, people jump to and fix it. And then it just is allowed to, you know, kind of go off and and uh, but the U.S. doesn't want to deal with it at that level because they say, well, it's an independent country. What Washington wants out of this relationship is land, 11 islands of the Kwajalein Atoll, leased for 12 million U.S. dollars a year. But the traditional landowners now want 19 million. The Americans have offered 15, and that's where the negotiations and the goodwill have stood. Well, you'd think $4 million in the days of multi-billion dollar defense budgets is just a drop in the bucket, and obviously it is. But that's exactly what has caused this roadblock at Kwajalein. Mike Kabua's vision is for a gentler, more traditional way of life. Without landowner consent, he says base closure is an option when the current lease expires in 2016. He now talks of implementing a radical solution to end the overcrowding on Ebi, sending everyone back to their home islands, even if that means no more American money. We told our government that maybe we should go back to our place, to our home, 
that's where we belong and live like everybody else here. Live like island level up people and lie. They have no quadrant, but they live okay. Does anybody in the Defense Department want to leave Kwajalein? I can't believe it based on what very high level people say, all the way from Defense Department people to U.S. ambassadors. I mean, there's no interest on the part of the United States to lose that asset. Vehicle navigation verified. First stage tank stabilized. Second the Americans stabilized. have no intention of going home. Got it, got it. In fact, they're expanding operations at the $4 billion facility. Last month, a commercial rocket company, SpaceX, launched a Malaysian satellite from here. It's just the first of many to come. Their Falcon 1 rocket can put satellites into a low Earth orbit. And they're looking at, and in fact testing, a larger version of it, Falcon 9 which, as you can figure, would have nine of the same engines instead of just the one. You got it. Got it. All right, you are go. It's a bright future, but scattered across the atoll are reminders of Kwajalein's bloody past. Ruined bunkers where thousands of Japanese fought to the death against US troops who stormed ashore here in the Second World War. The Americans never left and spent the next half century preparing for an apocalypse that never eventuated. Researcher Dan Farnham takes us on a nuclear history tour of the atoll. This place is a radar tracking building that was built back in the mid 1980s. And this was part of the, uh, the Star Wars defense program under then President Ronald Reagan. It's a blockhouse that was built to survive a nuclear hit. In 1989, of course, the uh, Soviet Union collapsed, the Berlin Wall came down, and as soon as that happened, the funding for this building was taken away, so it was never completed. We're going to head over to Carlson Island, and I'm going to show you a wreck that does a real good job tying World War II and the nuclear age together right here at Kwajalein Atoll. Right now, we're sitting right next to the wreck of the uh, Prinz Eugen. The Prinz Eugen was a German Admiral Hipper class heavy cruiser, and uh, it's one of the fleet units that managed to survive the war. Here is the venerable old carrier Saratoga, the submarine Skate, the Jap battleship Nagato, and the German heavy cruiser Prinz Eugen. The Prinz Eugen was part of a vast armada assembled by the US in 1946 at Bikini Atoll just 300 kilometers from here. One fire. These were America's first post-war atomic tests, designed to see if the ships would survive the world's most destructive weapons. In a tribute to German engineering, two nuclear blasts failed to sink the ship. The radioactive Hulk was then towed to Kwajalein for further study, where it capsized, contaminating the lagoon. It was in the early 1970s when the shipwreck was declared safe, radiological-wise, for diving and snorkeling. So you're not going to be spiking a Geiger counter after you finish diving this wreck today. The old Nazi warship is still remarkably intact. More than 200 metres long, the hull stretches off into the depths, the guns still visible. Was it a smart thing tying a radioactive ship from a nuclear blast into the atoll? Well, I mean, that's a great question. I think at that point in time, uh, there wasn't a whole lot known about the effects of radiation with regards to how radiation affected people and how dangerous it actually was. The Americans conducted 67 nuclear tests here up until 1958. The 
The most powerful, detonated at Bikini, was a thousand times larger than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Many Marshallese were caught in the massive radioactive fallout and suffered horrific injuries. They claimed they were human guinea pigs, but the US knew the probable effects all along. It's an assertion Washington still denies, although a special trust fund paid several hundred million dollars compensation to the survivors. But that money is now gone with more than $2 billion still owed to the claimants, many of whom resettled here on Kwajalein Atoll. This is not a place where people are burning American flags and saying, go home America. They're not. We have a very close relationship with the US on many levels. And yet, lately, I think a lot of the people who have issues to do with Kwajalein or to do with the nuclear testing program feel that the U.S. is ignoring one of its best friends uh, when it needs to resolve some of these problems. For the first time in living memory, chiefs and clan leaders have gathered for a traditional conclave at Kwajalein Atoll. The event is masterminded by eBay leader Mike Kabua, who says that he doesn't want his people to end up like destitute Americans. Mm. This meeting is about creating unity to confront both the Americans and their own government over Kwajalein. As traditional landowners, they're angry at being cut out of negotiations over the basis lease. But while there's plenty of colour and movement, there's little optimism for any real change on eBay. It's just nobody deals with these things until maybe there's a cholera outbreak or something and there's, oh my gosh, we've got a problem, let's, you know, fix it. Uh, but uh, long term, nobody, US, Marshall Islands, the leadership over there, it just, it's, it, nobody has really, in the last 10 or 15 years, nobody's come up with a game plan for long term improvement of eBay. We have a commitment to the defense of both the U.S. and Marshall East people, and, and I see that uh, our relationship and partnership going on for a very long time. At the end of the day, it's an unequal partnership between a struggling microstate surviving on financial handouts and a dominant superpower that needs a testing range for its nuclear missiles. As the ferry shuttles workers off into the night, it's evident who's in charge. They cook the meals, serve the drinks, here at one of the world's most sophisticated surveillance bases. But the people of Ebi could be forgiven for thinking that they've simply fallen off the radar.